So I'm so excited to talk to you about this issue. I'm Allison Yarrow, and I cover uh, the intersection of health and politics and sexual and reproductive health policy. Uh, and I'm a contributing editor at Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And I'm here with Harry Siegel, who is a senior editor at Newsweek and the Daily Beast, um, who okay. I've worked quite a bit with. And he has a great piece. Harry, I'm really excited for you to tell us about it. Where have all the babies gone? Where have they gone? Well, that that is a uh, that's the question. Since uh, since 2007, the uh, the fertility rate in the U.S. has dropped pretty dramatically, um, and is uh, suddenly below uh, below replacement uh, well below replacement level. It's at the lowest rate since uh, since reliable numbers were first kept in about 1920. So this has a number of implications if it, if it continues, and particularly if it continues even if the economy improves, which is an open question. Um, largely the idea of having a rapidly aging population, um, which is something that uh, Japan and Western Europe have dealt with that we have not, at least up until now. Um, in combination with this, you have the really interesting phenomena of, uh, of single women who are not necessarily, of course, the same as uh, as childless ones, although there is some overlap between the groups, um, voting overwhelmingly for uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Mitt Romney actually uh, wins very slightly uh, last year among married women, and two out of every three single women uh, vote for Obama. Uh, which So you have this, this group of... Uh, often younger women who, uh, who often don't have children who have become overwhelmingly democratic. So perhaps um, a surprising a byproduct of the fertility rate dropping is this political and ideological shift you're describing. Maybe. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure I would call it a byproduct, um, but there, there, there's certainly seems to be some relationship between the, uh, between the two that, that, that's interesting. Uh, and Republicans uh, seem to have, among various other groups, done a pretty solid job of alienating uh, of alienating single women. Who, in fact, provided Obama with his uh, margin of victory in the popular vote. Hmm. So, so, so you have a uh, you know something close to a low, particularly with the Democrat for the second straight time topping fifty percent. But if you uh, if you take single women out of the uh, out of the equation, you have a, a much much tighter election. And uh, I don't know the state-by-state state breakdown, but perhaps the Romney win. Can we talk about what exactly the fertility rate is, sort of how that's calculated, what you've what you found in your research? Sure. Um, well, basically, the, the, the fertility rate in the simplest, clumsiest terms is uh, how many uh, is uh, how many children women of a uh, of reproductive age uh, are, are are having in a uh, in a given, uh, are, are having. Um, another way of doing it is per thousand, uh, is, is how many babies you're having in a given year per thousand women. So basically, if you have a rate of, uh, the replacement rate is 2.1. So so um, if you have, since obviously you also need to replace men, and it's, it's women who are in fact uh, doing most of the uh, producing of the uh, babies and all of the delivering. Um, since uh, since the election, a bunch of conservative columnists have uh, have cottoned on to this. So uh, Ross Dufat wrote a column. Let's see, I have this here. Um, Decadence wrote, wrote wrote a column essentially saying that um, that, that, that uh, uh, American uh, uh, the American century is largely because we've had more babies than the uh, competition. Um, George Will has pointed to it as a uh, as a serious concern. And Jonathan Last of the Weekly Standard has a book out, "What to Expect When When No One's Expecting." Great title. Uh, arguing this is a disaster. Um, it's interesting that, that they're all conservatives who have been pointing to this, uh, given how the election turned out and the extent to which the uh, Republicans seem to have alienated uh, single women. But is it? I mean, is is fertility and, and birth rate are those things conservative issues per se? Historically, from from what you gather, well, I think they've become political issues um, because there there's uh, well, there's a very a high decline narrative on the right. 
Right, and there's um, a very high correlation, as, as we know from Last's research, uh, between religiosity and childbearing. Uh, typically, mm-hmm. families that attend church once a week have, you know, more children than families that attend church twice a year, you yes. know, across the religious spectrum. Yes, and uh, there, there's a book by uh, Eric Kaufman called, uh, Shall, uh, what is it, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? Uh, all about this, uh, pointing out that, that, that these various uh, conservative and religious groups tend to uh, by far outbreed their, uh, their, their secular counterparts. Um, of course, it's a very open question if, uh, if, if their children will also inherit their politics um, and uh, as well their, their high birth rates. Um, so, so, so the idea, I think, that the uh, breeders are going to uh, reproduce their way back into political power uh, is, is probably a touch exaggerated, like almost any sort of projection that goes out more than 20 years. Sure. I, uh, something, something that interested me about your piece, uh, it opens up in a hookah bar where you are speaking with uh, a couple of men and women who have, have chosen thus far to be childless. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and goes on to, you get some, some interesting quotes about, um, you know, little rugrats and sort of being disgusted by the idea of, of birthing and raising children. But um, a group that I really, I would have loved to see represented, I think, more in the piece is, is those who choose to be childless for economic reasons, which, you, you know, you point out 2007 leading into 2008 is exactly when the economy begins to, you know, well, we, we had a recession and people really chose to not be childless. Maybe they didn't want to make that choice, but it was, it was a, an economic decision for families. Well, did you, I, I, did I mean, you come I, across any people in your research, any couples who had, had made the choice to be childless because of economic circumstances? Many, and, and uh, there, there are actually many more in a piece we have up at the Daily Beast now um, with our reader stories about why they choose to be uh, uh, child-free. What were uh, some we of those stories? the term childless, and uh, we're, we're scolded by many dedicated people without children who said child-free is their preferred term. I haven't lost anything. Mm. Um but, but many of them brought up economic reasons. Um, the question is whether or not, and uh, this has been very complicated and elsewhere, the birth rate goes back up when the economy improves. Um, uh, various countries that have had really low birth rates, like, like in the 1.5 range, where you're really losing population quickly if you're not uh, bringing, in, uh, bringing in immigrants, a lot of immigrants, um, have tried direct payments um, much more generous sorts of uh, family weave, and uh, to create real incentives to uh, to have more kids. Subsidized and it found care. that the, once the fertility rate has dropped below a certain point, it, it, it's it's really difficult to do. Germany, for instance, uh, um, has has gone way out of its way to court uh, prospective parents, as it were, um, and has gotten very limited results. And, and of course, when you do that, a lot of those payments go to people who will be having children anyway, which is which is great, but means you're not necessarily using the dollars to accomplish the, uh, the policy goal of more children that you're, uh, that you're after. Um, so I, I'm a real believer in, uh, in, in marginal incentives. Um, I think that in the developed secular world, it's natural to have a fertility rate below replacement rate, like we've seen, again, in, in Europe and in Japan, and in fact, in most of the first world. Right, in um, educated societies. But, but when you have educated women who have control, uh, uh, who have control over their fertility, um, they, they make choices involving, uh, involving careers, uh, life partners, uh, just whether not they, they want to carry and give birth to a baby and invest the 20 years that you're going to, you know, tend to be a responsible parent. Um, they're, they're just, uh, you know, the, the, the state of the economy, it, it's not, it's a massive commitment. Um, and so well, and something, piece, that, something that strikes... use the term selfish... Uh, and, and say, say you know, per, uh, perhaps some of the reasons people aren't having children is selfish. And uh, what's funny is... That, that, that word doesn't sit well with me. I, I, it didn't sit well with a lot of people. I, I point out that it, it came up with several of the women we talked to. Yeah, it comes up in a lot of the stories people offered for, them, for themselves. How, in what and context? I, I, How is bottom line, I, 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 what's funny is you think conservatives would be applauding this. Um, I have no issue with, with, with selfishness. I think... Everyone considers uh, their, their, their life circumstance, their motives, how much of their time they want to give up. Uh, I, by the way, continue my disclosures, and the parent of a one-year-old, 
And the reason that the interview was in a hookah bar was not because of the hip, young, childless things I was with, but because it was an inexpensive and reasonably quiet place, in fact, deserted, uh, of other customers where we could talk. Did you bring um, your baby? I'm sorry? Did you bring your child? I did not bring my child, uh, we, uh, you know, as, as part of the, uh, the professional interviewing process. Pro tips, um, I, I brought pictures of beer. Mm -hmm. Right. And pictures of your child. Yes, yes, I did bring pictures of my child who is adorable. Yes. See, I'm a sensitive, I'm a sensitive journalist reporting this. I'm also a father, right? That was... Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, talking to people who are really determined to be childless, who are, are not representative of the broader yes. cohort of people who don't have children in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you, you hear some hilarious things before going home to your baby, like, I can't imagine something sadder than a 35-year-old man chasing a two-year-old around. I'm like, trust me, I can imagine it. It's well, not so sad. Well, let's talk about, let's get into a little more about some of the, some of the reasons why it's difficult, the economic circumstances are difficult for women and families now. I mean, it's, there's a Well, profound... female managers are a lot less likely to have children than their male counterparts. They're less likely to be married. Um, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, uh, in, in the U.S., fantastic uh, maternity leave policies. Yeah, we uh, are in an economy now where, um, where older people aren't leaving their jobs. In a stagnant economy, older people aren't leaving their jobs. New ones aren't opening up. Uh, there, there's pretty widespread pessimism among both high school and college graduates about their own futures. Um, it's, a, it, it's a difficult moment to want to... Uh, to for, for a lot of people who are coming out of well, a fair amount of debt from uh, from college, for college graduates, and are paying the bill for an increasing number of older people who are now past their, uh, what Mitt Romney might call their making years, and into their taking years, um, there's, I think, a, a fair amount of economic burden and uncertainty that's not really conducive to choosing to have a child. Well, and and that's part of the with... shift we're seeing are people going from, from just having children, and the piece does get into this, to, to, to recognizing that it's a, it's a decision. It's something you have to actively uh, But I think what complicates that decision for many families and disproportionately for many women is the fact that women's earning power still is, is just completely eclipsed by men's mm -hmm. earning power often forcing women who are carrying the pregnancy to also take on the majority of the responsibility in, in child care, which isn't necessarily always the choice that a family wants to make, but in terms of economics makes the most sense if the woman's, you know, earning less, typically she'll leave her job to care for a child. And this is, you know, it's a choice that, that well, she doesn't well, want no, to No, I mean, even when the woman's make. making more, frequently she, she ends up being the one who leaves. And there, there, there are a lot of... Uh, of, of, uh, of husbands who are not taking on half of the child rearing responsibility. Despite um, research that shows separate. that they want to. Uh, yes. Uh, d d despite that research that, that, that says they want to, I think it's very different in the abstract than as a 25-hour-a-week uh, commitment, say, while working. Sure, and then the average work week for, you know, for a dual-employed household now is between 80 and 100 hours a week. So I that's mean, my that's, work week. That's yeah, exactly right. And mine too. And it's just, you know, it's, it's unsustainable and there's very little support. I mean, the, the family and medical leave act, which Bill Clinton signed in 1993, that turns 20, I believe this month. And there's been very little built upon that. That was always, you know, the center, um, what is it? The, the national partnership for women and families who, Past that, that was always intended as a first step. It was never intended to be comprehensive. And basically, right now, what it does is it allows for there's no standardized paid uh, paternal leave. It allows for companies with 50 employees or more to um, to grant leave, paid leave of some sort to to women, not always to men. Um, it's often up to the discretion of the company. And but there's just there's nothing there's nothing standardized and holistic available for everyone. And then also child care. I mean, many people argue that the child care system is broken. There isn't an understanding in the work environment of the needs of child care. And subsidized child care is something that you, you know, you mentioned earlier has been tried in other countries to, you know, to encourage uh, the birth rate to, to skyrocket. Yes. No, no, no. It's been tried and, and it's had a marginal effect on birth rates is one of the, is one of the interesting things. And so 
so so so you, you, the flip side to to what you're bringing up, uh, of all which as a uh, as, as a new parent I agree with and I'm very sympathetic to, uh, is the idea that, that we have to have more and more sort of uh, standardized policies and sort of a larger and larger government role in arenas that have long belonged to the family. So one of the reasons people have children, especially in an urban environment where they are uh, where, where, where they're pretty plainly a net loss, like as opposed to if you're working them on the farm, is uh, is as a form of uh, of old age insurance protection that there's going to be someone there to take care of you. And part of what traditionally is factored into childbearing decisions is having sort of a large family or community group around that, that is going to pick up some of that role. Um, and in place of that, increasingly, it, it, it's a question of how, how, can, how can we mandate employers do this, which I'm all for, uh, and create a, a, a fairer and simpler setup so that people can both work and have children. And I don't think there are easy answers to that um, on one side. As in, I don't think that's necessarily going to massively impact the uh, the, the fertility rate, um, which has become sort of the standalone conservative concern. Um, I do think that, that it makes it much easier for, for, for potential parents who are considering their economic circumstance. I was talking with another editor here earlier today who was saying, look, you know, I would like to have children. I don't think, I mean, in an economy or a position just yet to do so, um, I think it helps a lot for, for, for people working those things out. I would have loved to have had a longer fertility break here when my child was born. Well, I and I mean, out. I think we, you know, we overlook the great, um, you know, just the wondrous thing that it is that we have that choice now, right? With with some, you know, 99% of women at some point in their life will be on some form of birth control. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have evolved to the point where we can we can make choices about when and if we want to become parents, and that's a that's a wonderful choice to have. But I think there's two separate things. There's, there, there's the question of, of having family friendly and woman friendly policies, um, so 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 that the, the, the women can engage in the workforce, be paid the uh, be, be paid the same as men doing the same work, um, and not have the, the option of, of family life sort of taken away for all but super achievers in the course of doing that. Mm -hmm. And then separately, there's the question of the fertility rate, and if it stays as low as it's been, and we now have net zero immigration with, uh, with, with, with Mexico, where the own fertility right. rate has dropped that dramatically. Point. Talk about that point about how the immigration, um, how immigrants in this country have impacted the birth rate. Well, they, they, they've been a, a huge boon to oh, it. Yeah. So, so people can come here and have a slightly below replacement birth rate, and you have immigrants with larger families who sort of fill that gap. And, uh, you know, our, our, our debate about immigration, particularly with Mexico, is just lagged way, way behind the, the facts, like uh, the, the economic facts, effectively. The, the, um, since, since, since we, uh, we, we, we hit our Great Recession, um, we basically haven't had new immigrants to speak. The new immigrants we have had, um, have a slightly higher, like 2.4, I think, fertility rate, but that drops to American norms of one generation. So they're not providing these uh, the, 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 this, these additional citizens who are helping to uh, to, uh, to fill the gap for us in the way I think people are, are, are assuming from past results. Uh, no guarantee of future indicators, and, and you know those numbers seem to have shifted dramatically. I think it's unlikely. Just instinctively to me, that when the economy recovers, that America is going to have an exceptionally high fertility rate again compared to other developed countries. Why um, is that? We're increasingly uh, we're increasingly urbanized, which tends to uh, which tends to shrink family size. Um, our immigration patterns have changed pretty dramatically, and I think uh, I think new cultural norms that, that are pretty healthy and good for the most part are, are, are setting in. Um, where, where there's much less of a stigma and not having, say, not getting married or getting married and not having children. Um, so the, the, the people who are, are making somewhat uh, passive or in the course of their life decisions are, are less likely in aggregate to end up having, having children, having as many children as would have been the case uh, even just 20, 25 years ago. And I mean, more you know, more for the most part, government sanctioned policies and and laws have supported not having children, perhaps than, than even having children. Now, you know, with um, with the the new the Health Care Act with Obamacare ACA, um, we get free 
birth control when we have health insurance. Uh, there's There hasn't been any improvement, you know, since 1993 on policies to promote sort of to promote families. So that that's a clear message. I mean, the only thing in the Health Care Act that does anything for women in the workplace who want families as well, there was an add-on late in the game uh, for employers are now required to provide space for women to breastfeed. Right. So that's the extent of what was uh, bargained right. for in the Affordable Care Act. So, so, well, so well, women well, can well. have that, but, but there really isn't much else. Nick Gillespie, who wrote a terrific piece for Reason a few months ago called The Screw Generation, uh, my, 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 my partner on the piece piece, Joel Kotkin, uh, who actually did most of the demographic reporting there while I was uh, interviewing talking with him, had his own piece uh, for Newsweek called The uh, Screw Generation. But in Gillespie's piece, um, look, one of the points he makes is young people don't really need health insurance. They, they might need health care, they might need catastrophic care, but they're, they're, they're forced into the system where they're taking a loss to subsidize older people. I mean, that, 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 that's how this is built, and arguably that's fine, and, and someone's going to pay the cost of care for those older people in any case. But again, you start getting into complicated generational politics, and the, the austerity fights we've had over the last several years have, have largely been about the, these large bills were racking up on behalf of older people and people who are no longer working. Um, and uh, the, the, the medical care that, that you're receiving and paying for. Um, well, our entitlement security and other system benefits. is broken. You know, our entitlement system is broken. I mean, that's certainly another area where that's going to be Well, our entitlement system works pretty well if you're, you're retired at the moment for a lot of people. I don't think it's going to continue to work necessarily. So, so, so I think you're, you're seeing the stage really set for, for, for even with growth, uh, economic growth, so what we haven't seen in a few years now, for, for fairly serious generational conflict. Um, and, and that gets that needs further complicated if we have less young people and more older ones. Obviously, they'll, they'll sort of tip the political numbers on one side. On the other, on the other side, the, the less workers, the, the, uh, the lower the ratio of workers to retirees, uh, the uglier these fights become and the more difficult the, uh, the numbers become to sustain. But I would argue that rather than, you know, approach the, the declining fertility rate in a way that says, you know, uh-oh, we better, we better get this back up or we're not going to be able to pay for the elderly is not the right way to approach it. I think really approaching it from closing the gender wage gap and subsidizing childcare and creating just a more, you know, passing policies, you know, that allow for families to thrive. I mean, that's, no one's going to have a child because they want the birth rate to stay up. I mean, that's just, it's not a, I mean, you can speak from experience. It's probably not something you and your wife considered before you decided to have a child. No, this is the, uh, I mean, this is really the center of, 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 of our piece is that you have the, this real shift between the very sensible decisions individuals are making about whether or not to have, and increasingly those are the same reasons. Um, and, uh, and and the aggregate results of those decisions. So, so, so you're right. The question is, how do you come up with policies that shift that math? Um, and then how I, I, I do you pass them in a do-nothing Congress? Yeah. It's, it's also pretty yeah. 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 Wait, I, 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 I want to hear some of the stories. You you gathered all of these stories about women who didn't want to have children for various reasons. Were there some that that were uh, that resonated with you that you yeah, share? Well, there were some really interesting ones, and I, I encourage readers to go to, uh, to, to the Beast and check all of them out, of course. Um, and, and some some surprising and touching ones for people in very different places in their life that, that then we would necessarily been expecting, thinking about this in the abstract. There's one um, from a uh, person who's been together with his partner for uh, 30 years, have the uh, longest lasting relationships of anyone in their family, stable, prosperous, happy. You know, people tell them they'd be excellent parents, you know, according to the, uh, the story that was sent in by uh, Patrick from California. Um, and then explains, uh, but they haven't created their own family due to only one reason. Uh, we were two gay men, came to maturity at a time, and having a family was so outside the norm that to do so seemed with anything else selfish and adultery. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps were we 30 years younger and entered into a relationship today, we choose differently. Are we happy with our lives together? Exceedingly. Would we be happier with children? Perhaps not happier, but uh, happier in more ways. And, and 
I, I think broadly the shifts in social norms we've had to give more freedom and more fairness to more people to uh, to try to create a uh, a, uh, a, a, uh, a workforce that's more decent for women to give, uh, to give gay couples the same rental, contractual, and other rights as everyone else have been fundamentally good and healthy. Right? They come with complicated demographic implications, for instance. That's something we have to navigate, figure out how generous we, we can afford to be with old people, how much debt we want to take out, uh, how we can shift some of these incentives to, uh, to marginally push up the fertility rate. But I don't think the idea is uh, if, if we sort of pay enough money benefits or shift things dramatically, every woman's going to have three children. I think that's ridiculous. Um, I don't think it's reasonable to assume that there's some set of, uh, of government programs, incentives, or payments that are going to make up that entire gap. Uh, I think people are likely in the developed world to have less children. Well, I think I mean, we have to figure out how to deal with that and how to deal with that over a brief 40-year period where the numbers change quickly enough and dramatically enough that you end up with more older people to younger people than is generally healthy. Uh, other parts of the world, much of the Muslim world, is, is dealing with the opposite, where, where there's a, just a youth explosion right now. Yeah, can we talk um, about, let's bring in some of the, you know, the groups who are really prolific now, who are having many children, which is the, you know, the ultra-religious across the spectrum. They're having lots of kids. They can't solve this for us. You don't think the Orthodox Jews and the Muslims and the Mormons and evangelical Christians, they, they can't solve this? Uh, in the U.S.? I mean, I, I, I hope not. I, I feel like you're talking, so, I, 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 I am a... Uh, how do they like? How do they factor into this? You know, the the populate, like, for instance, the population of, of Orthodox Jews in New York City in the last decade has grown by twenty five thousand. I mean, they're having mm -hmm. more children than than ever before. And you yes, know, this and goes many back more than secular Jews. Position. And their children are more likely to remain Jewish. So, 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 so what a New York Jew is has shifted dramatically. I know you just spent the Purim in Williamsburg, um, which is uh, which is always a hoot. Um, but I mean, I, I, there are a whole number of problems with depending on the uh, on, on the very religious to uh, to to breed us to safety. Um, first <laughs> off, um, it might not be the ideological uh, safe harbor that we're we're seeking. You and I. The the, the um, you're talking about groups that are frequently not very. Uh, uh, are, are hostile to homosexuals, um, treat women in different ways like second-class citizens, and otherwise are at some odds with, uh, with, with, with our broader civil society um, in ways I find troubling. Um, with the Orthodox Jews in New York, and Israel, of course, has dealt with this in much more intense terms. You're not talking about a group that's large enough to wield real political power that doesn't that, that in many instances is not contributing a lot to the tax base, where many people are taking social benefits so that they can uh, study rather than work, um, and depending on a larger group of taxpayers to uh, to, to have that work. Uh, and because people are, are frequently taking uh, voting, we show up to vote, and vote in ways the community leaders are instructing them to, um, it's a group that's done a very good job of milking the system. You can have relatively small groups doing that. If you have too many of them, like if you have too many old people and not enough retirees, things get badly out of whack in ways that are simply not sustainable. Like, you know, at some point, just arithmetically, something has to give. Can we talk about... Uh, of course, of course, we're, we're assuming here, or I think you are in the way you frame that, that, that all of the children are going to stay within these groups. Um, I also think that, that anti-modern groups in modern societies tend to do best when, when they're, 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 they're sort of small enough, uh, small enough in their size and their uh, geographic footprints to sort of maintain control within that group. And uh, they, they tend to have a lot of members leak out and become utterly ordinary very quickly. Like one of the women I talked to for the story, her grandmother is a, uh, is a famous country singer who I'm not, uh, not allowed you to You can't name, tell us who she is. Reasonably well known, and um, and she is uh, you know she's an anarchist uh, tattoo artist uh, and illustrator living in New York. Um, a lot happens in a couple of generations. But that's I mean that is that's more the exception than the rule, because otherwise places where I'm like where I'm from right I'm from uh, the South which is is very conservative. 
Um, otherwise, you know, by now everybody would have rejected their, you know, their sort of Bible beating pasts and have, would have become liberal if that were the, the rule. I, which is to say that the woman that you interviewed, the tattoo artist, I think she's, you know, I think she's unique in not um, perpetuating the ideologies that she came with. Can we, uh, can we talk about marriage? Because I think marriage plays into this quite a bit, doesn't it? Well, well, well the changing well, face of marriage. I, some viewer will correct me if this is apocrypha, but my understanding is when the, 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 uh, when, when, when the original dismal scientist, when Malthus um, uh, uh, um, more or less breaks the back of the Enlightenment, um, the, one of the ways a lot of Europe responds is he uses marriage as, uh, as, as a uh, functional synonym for, uh, uh, for, for having children, mm. is by substantially raising the marriage age. So, oh God, we're going to have this unsustainable population. You know, you have exponential growth population, only arithmetic growth resources. Um, this is bad. Um, so, a fair amount of Europe responds by dramatically raising marriage rates, like from you know 14, 15, 16 to 25. Um, this does not actually stop people from fuck or having. Can I say that on the internet? Yeah, sure. I, I hope so. All right. Uh, this does not necessarily stop people from from reproducing and getting pregnant and having children. So the. Uh, consequence is a generation of illegitimate children at a time when that carried a great deal more stigma than uh, I think it does say to, in the U.S. today, for the most part. Um, I just, uh, I'm sorry, repeat the question, Alice? Well, I wanted to talk about marriage because, I mean, it, it mm -hmm. seems to me that the trajectory... There, there, there's still significant overlap between, between marriage and having children. Um, Right, and seeing, that marriage, ma despite what we might think by, you know, reading the magazines and the websites that we read, uh, despite those, you know, the projections that marriage is eroding, um, nine out of ten people still will get married at some point. And so those of us who it's available to. Um, so, you know, there's still that, there's still that desire and many people, you know, many people are having, are still having children. But I think, I think what was interesting to me was that um, there's this argument that, you know, once, once women had birth control, you know, once uh, the feminist awakening, the, um, the feminist mystique and everyone, you know, everyone's awake to, to birth control, um, we don't, we don't need to, we don't need to get married. We don't need to have a, a ton of children and we can, you know, perpetuate our, um, our career lives and we can, you know, move forward in that way. And just the idea that delaying marriage and having access to birth control means less children. I mean, that's, that's part of your argument, right? Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah. So, so running through a couple numbers in the piece, um, marriage, American marriage in a lot of ways has been altering both in, in, in practice and in theory. So 44% of millennials, including a good many who say that they, 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 uh, they'd like to get married or have been married, say marriage is obsolete as an institution. Um, among the, uh, among the 56%, um, excuse me, among those who, uh, who, who, uh, who, uh, 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 support the institution of marriage, um, the numbers for, like, the things that matter within a marriage have been reasonably stable. Things like uh, shared politics, a willingness to do household chores and others have, like, moved up or down, mostly up just a little bit. The one big outlying uh, uh, factor that people have changed their minds about since 1990 is children. In 1990, 65% of, uh, of the people in the same age range say that, that uh, children are an important part of a marriage. That's 41% today. Um... In the meantime, the percentage of adults who uh, disagree with the contention people without children lead empty lives has gone from 59% in 2002, so 10 years ago, to under 40% now. Uh, so under 40% of people in this Oh, I'm sorry. It has gone, it went, went from the, the people who believe that, that you have an empty life without children was, uh, was, was 39% in 1988, and it's now 59% who disagree with that. Who disagree with childlessness means an empty life. Mm hmm Hmm. So, 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 I mean, I think you're, you're seeing 
some uh, some separation of of, of, uh, of, of of marriage and children, and I think you're, you're seeing sort of a uh, a sense that there's lots of ways to have good, meaningful lives without children, and people decided wow. to do that, and uh, that, that, hey, I'm able to retire. I'm not carrying around all of this debt. I can travel freely. Um, I, I, um, I, I avoid all of these economic burdens that are completely reasonable. Um, so, so going back to feminism for a second, um, it's interesting. Uh, if it, so suddenly you have all these women who, who have access to birth control, who want to be involved in the broader professional world, who have other women who have already done that, who, uh, you know, who, who, can, who can mentor and open up doors and, and create a sense of this as something that's fully normative, uh, as, as opposed to outlying in any sense. I mean, the Beast is, uh, is actually a great example of this. You know, you've got Tina Brown, um, the executive editor, uh, the managing editor, are, are, are female. Um, it's... Well, I'm just eyeballing the office. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's um, it's a lot of women. It, it's it's a lot of women. It's within my sight range right now to be ridiculously anecdotal. I would say it's sixty percent women using mathematics, um, and and that that's that's great. Um, those women, many of them, are going to be at different points focused on their careers. Uh, lots of them will at different points leave. Um, uh, uh, take maternity leaves, start families, lots of others won't. So let's just say for a minute that, that, that with, uh, with the world as it is, that we end up with the fertility rate among these women of something like we have, we have now. Maybe a little lower because this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a professional New York uh, city class. Uh, New York, Manhattan being particularly, ridiculously childless place. So let's say it's like 1.7. So that's great. That can be terrific for all those individual women in Rome. I think it's perfectly sustainable over a long period of time for the nation. I think the, the, the stretch, the transitional stretch, in which the rate goes from, from two point something down, uh, down, down to 1.9 or 1.8, and you have a generation where there's just a lot more older people than younger people, is likely to be really disruptive. I think it's likely to be economically disruptive. I think it's likely to be uh, culturally different. I think, uh, I remember when I was in college, everyone around me, I was around Boston, so everyone is young, everyone's a college student. And it was weird, it was just not a natural population group. Right. When recently I was in Ann Arbor You never saw babies or, or the elderly when you were in college. Yeah, <laughs> but at the University of Michigan, it's like, um, you know, a higher ed is increasingly female, and schools actively try to avoid the quote unquote tipping point, which is 60% female because it starts screwing up the gender ratio for both sexes. So what Michigan did was they had about 34,000 students. They added 8,000 more students. Almost all of them are from out of state, so they pay higher tuition. And they're overwhelmingly male. And they're qualitatively, or excuse me, quantitatively, not as smart as the women. So you have more women than men, dumber men than women. And it creates like horrible, like a, 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 a horrible dating economy for the women. It's fantastic for the men. They're in, they're in short supply. And the shortcomings are much more easily overlooked um, in that sort of, in similar ways, I think culturally having a, 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 a really aged society where, where, where these are the people who are setting the rules in a lot of ways can have really ugly effects. I'm not just talking about like Seth MacFarlane hosting the Oscars. Um, what, uh, about, uh, what about the fact that we're living longer than ever before, too? I mean, that place is an additional burden. Oh my goodness! So the, the the new finance minister in Japan, um, <laughs> uh, Taro Aso, um, last month uh, he said that the uh, elderly need to hurry up and die. Mm. Uh, heaven forbid if you are forced to live on when you want to die. He said about the uh, two people, as he called them. Um, I would wake up feeling increasingly bad knowing this was all being paid for for the government. But there's, I mean, there's. I mean, that's horrible. But it's it's. <laughs> It's horrible, but I mean, the, the reality is we are living longer. Our work lives are spanning, you know, decades longer than, than our ancestors and our forebears. And it's blocking young people and from getting into the economy and finding decent jobs well, because their parents won't leave it. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think now people are having more jobs than ever before. They don't, you know, you don't graduate from, you know, the business with a gold watch after 60 years. You have multiple jobs and multiple careers. And that, I think, inc also increases the possibility for innovate, innovation uh, in in older generations. I mean, typically, you know, innovation is thought of as something that's 
owned by young people, the young college educated sort of Mark Zuckerbergs and, mm-hmm. and others innovating. But, you know, now that we're living longer and we're having multiple careers, I mean, there, you know, I think there's much I more. I mean, go, go, go talk to Richard Florida. I, be serious. What, like, you really think it's awesome to be a 55 year old who needs to start a, a new career, like, like retool, uh, prove your credentials, I didn't say and, that. And, and, and like, I, 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 but I really think it's what you're suggesting. I think it's really difficult for people who came up with one social contract and are, are, are later in their careers looking ahead potentially to retirement and suddenly uh, um, are dealing with an entirely different economy and set of terms to deal with that for you. Oh, I'm so, not saying so, it's yeah. not difficult, but, I, but they're still working. They're not, you know, they're not retiring. They're, they're continuing along the career trajectory and they're taking on more jobs and there's more potential for them to offer more to our society also. I, I don't know. I think people who are forced to stay, uh, who, are, who are forced to work past what they want to do because of uh, our economy, I don't think that's a great thing. I think it's very difficult for older people who, who did have an expectation of working at one place or two places and you put in your time. You get things done, and, uh, and then you retire, and you're taken care of. Have that pulled away from them? That's that's brutal. I think people who want to go out and discover new things and, and be creative, and interesting, have always been able to do it. Um, I think making that mandatory is an awful lot to ask of uh, of a lot of people who are happy to show up, get things done. Maybe they have a, a, a you know family or other interests outside of work, saying saying, "Hey, isn't it great that, that they've got to go out and rediscover themselves?" It just seems like uh, wrong. To me. Okay. Like really, really wrong. No, I'm not suggesting Shame that. I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's Shame like an optimistic spin to the fact that we are living longer instead of simply talking about the inverted pyramid yeah. that we have, you know, potentially with the birth rate uh, declining in the way that you describe in the piece. Um, sorry, my screen blocked out for a second. Um, so aside from what you describe in the piece, which is that the birth rate is declining, is there a way for us to 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 use to sort of use the brain power and the manpower power and the creative energy of older people who are living longer um, rather than just sort of lumping them in this category of those in need of entitlements and our entitlement system being insufficient to to supply them no 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 that's just way too optimistic i'm not a (laughs) pessimist i'm very cranky about you're not a pessimist people the conservatives who've been writing about this because i I think it's like their party has lost these single women and so 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 they want to point to this as as a problem that must be dealt with uh and if we can convert them to a married women with children don't uh, blame and victimize those women and accuse them of not you know bearing their uh their load of of babies yeah yeah they did produce your share ladies um, I, I really is sort of like the subtext of a lot of this argument. I think it, it, it's hugely creepy. But, but, but. So you, no, you no, admit. It, it's not, you, you're, you're optimism about old people. It, uh, and, 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 and that they can rediscover and reinvigorate. I, I'm very skeptical of. Wait, let's, wait way, let's go back to this. Allison, let's Allison, let, me, let me finish this up, please. P- people have uh, um, these, uh, this sort of forceful, this sort of forceful optimism. That, that can be really misleading. So, for instance, if, if, if feminism means that we, we potentially have a shrinking domestic population, this can still be a good thing, but there are serious policy implications and questions about our age curve that have to be dealt with. That's not to condemn feminism. Um, in, 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 in the same way, like, if old people are forced to find new jobs and new work collectively, yes, there's good to be found in that. Yes, some people will, will, will rediscover or reconnect with the world, but that's fundamentally a, 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 a bad and disruptive thing. And what's more, it does block young people from finding jobs. It means there's more people in the workforce competing for, for what positions are available. But your Public argument are, are but fairly Harry, limited. Like in the same way, when, when we talk about schools and public education, like one of the big things public education is, when you get past being euphemistic about this, is it's a way to warehouse children. One, so they don't enter the, uh, the labor force and drop the, uh, the, the, the price floor for everyone else it's because they work cheap when they have to work. And two, more, more to work seriously, so that their parents can work. Um, that, that is part of the public good that these schools are providing. Um, they're also supposed to be creating an educated workforce that, that matches up reasonably well with, with like the jobs and skills that are available. And those jobs and skills are changing quickly enough the number of jobs and the number of good jobs seems to be shrinking, and the number of people fighting for them is larger than we would have expected because people are not exiting the workforce. That is not something to be optimistic about. No, I'm, I'm not optimistic about that. I'm in agreement with you about that. But my question was tracking with your research that 
pretty soon we're going to have an elderly population that, you know, outpaces a younger population. I wondered if there was anything to sort of gain from that. And so you're saying, no, don't be optimistic there. No, the, 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 the good things will happen. People will do interesting and creative work that will benefit the broader society. People will discover careers and life options they didn't think they would have had before. Good things happen in almost any setup. The question is, you know, wh whether it's serving some, some, some larger or broader good or not, I think. Yeah, um, I, I just think it's difficult also to talk about, to talk about this sort of from a statistic perspective solely rather than from a, an individual family perspective, because, you know, as we talked about earlier, no one, no one makes the decision to have children or not to have children based on the birth rate. They make mm -hmm. it based on their, you know, their economic status about their, you know, their value system, where they come from, where they mm -hmm. live. There are lots of factors and people are so, still... So those older people discovering themselves and like providing things that create broader social good? The marriage age, yeah, the marriage children. age, you know, the average age of, of a man getting married is now 27 or 28 and a woman is 25 or 26. I mean, that's pretty unprecedented. The window for fertility then with marriage being later is, is a narrower window with, you know, women sort of having less of a chance of conceiving after the age of 35. I mean, you have all of these, these are, but these are all to me. I think implicitly you're thinking about professional, reasonably well-educated women who live in urban environments, especially the way you're stacking up marriage and having children. Well, this is so the average. This is, this is the national average. Order. These are the national averages for ages of, of those getting married. Yeah. 27, yeah, yeah. 28 for a man, 26, 25 for a woman. So it's still, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not 18. It's not 22. I mean, it's a different, it's a different ball game. And this isn't just about, this isn't just about urban environments. This is national averages. So, but I think, I mean, I think that does, that plays into it. And there being a shorter window for fertility, for the possibility of conceiving a child is, is playing into this also. Well, first off, that, that's if you're getting married first, if your priority at that point getting married for, for generally for the one, but, but for both partners, uh, then is a career or child raising. Um, yeah, it, it creates a uh, it creates a shorter window. And arguably there's something healthy about that. I'm not sure. I see a lot of people who, especially ones who have graduated post, uh, post OA, um, who are just like have graduated really from college. For, yeah. Yeah, so 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 we're sort of starting their adult lives now, since since we've now deferred adult life at the least until after college, um, who are having a harder time sort of sort of finding their 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 their, their way or place or role in the world, and are, are sitting a lot of this out, um, and you know maybe the economy turns around and they will, and uh, uh, they'll have children later, and that'll be fine, and they'll have discovered things about themselves in life in the meantime. I don't know. Um, that, that, that would be that would be optimistic. <laughs> so, so what kind of role? I mean, does does the economy rebound? Do we pick up from this, or do we tack in a different direction? That is the uh, mark of a good story, <laughs> right? Is uh, we don't know the answer. That's why you. That's why you want to pay attention. I mean, I, I, I'm in no way qualified to say where the economy is going to be in ten years. Um, and assuming it's improving or healthy. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what effect that does or does not have on the fertility rate. I also expect that that, um, that over the next four years we may see um, some some really difficult fights between the White House and uh, Congress, depending in part on where we end up after the 2014 elections, about about trying to create a better deal <laughs> for prospective parents. Um, I'm curious how Republicans and where does that come shift from? on these issues because a lot of bigger employers share some of the concerns I have. Um, you know, is that going to, I mean, what do you predict? I mean, it didn't, it didn't come from the Health Care Act, which seemed like, a, to me, a logical place to, to reform. What about the, you know, the Family and Medical Leave Act or the, you know, the, the uh, Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which had been proposed and, and, and failed? I mean, are there, do you see a, a path for this kind of reform? in Congress or in the Senate or in the White House? Maybe from the, the White House, which I expect to be very executive or uh, uh, executive order oriented over the next couple of years at least. And they've been projecting that that is how they're going to be pushing some of these policies through. So I, who knows? Maybe the uh, the the wife of Julia uh, 
it's easier. You love the life of Julia. Wait, remind everybody what the life of Julia is. The life of Julia was the uh, the flash ad that the Obama campaign ran um, during the uh, during the campaign last year, uh, showing this woman's life and all the benefits she would get. Uh, she, she's received under the Obama administration and everything that Romney would take away. Uh, conservatives' heads collectively exploded about this, like, fairly ordinary pocketbook appeal. Um, because you never see a husband or a wife partner. Um, and while well, Julia decides to have a child who, uh, who um, receives free health services under, the, uh, under Obamacare um, and then goes to a public uh, kindergarten on a school bus, um, the child is never seen again, and the husband or uh, father is never seen at all. Um, so, so Rush Limbaugh in particular went on a fantastic monologue about how uh, it's not the fault of the stupid young people who are swayed by this, that they're so stupid. Um, and then muttered dark things about Nazis and communists. It was uh, <laughs> swell. Um, and as sort of a ridiculous overstatement about uh, a somewhat more serious set of conservative questions about uh, about uh, how much of a role government should play and how healthy or unhealthy that is for the broader society. Um, that goes back really to health insurance and questions of how wide the safety net should be and how many people it needs to cover and to what extent everyone should therefore be paying into it. What are the austerity questions and what we're going to work out over the next uh, with the rest of our adult lives? Can't wait. It sounds really exciting. Cheers. We'll, uh, we'll say we leave it there and uh, we'll report back at the end of our adult lives. Yeah, I'm I'm willing to do that, and I, and and meantime we'll be we'll be uh we'll be following uh, the perhaps the signing of that executive order okay. giving uh, lots of a year of, of paternity and maternity leave. Um, wait, my computer just went out again. Shit, hang on. Um, so yeah, so I'll just I'll be looking for that executive order that provides um, a year of maternity and paternity leave uh, across the board to every American employee. I'll be looking for that. Cheers. I'll be looking forward to that, too. And if it happens, I'm just going to go out and have as many babies as I can. Okay, great. Um, if it's a year, that's great because I can do it all with my wife. Yeah, you should check in with four her. four months of leave. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Harry. This was fun. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Take care. Bye.